one. Welcome, everybody. This is the Champcast. So for those of you who don't know, if you haven't seen any of my posts about this yet, what the Champcast is, I take people who I believe are champions of their industry, bring them on to talk about their uh, what they work in their industry, just basic facts, things we could consider uh, to possibly change, things they like, things they don't like. And it's also utilized for the people that want to get into that industry to give them tips on the best way to go about that other than just saying what everybody says which is just go to college or go to technical school or go to this or go to that. It, we're going to give you actual advice on how you should get into that. So uh, this is Jacob Smith. He is an accomplished journalist, uh, aspiring documentarian, graduated from Texas Christian University and he is just an all-around badass. I love the hell out of this guy and we have powerful talks all the time. So first things first, uh, how do you feel about with this current presidential election? You worked at Huffington Post during the last election uh, with the, the attack on the media and how everything's going right now to where people don't even take the facts anymore. They just say they're false because they don't like them. Sure, sure. So attacks on the media. Um, I think there's people to blame on every single side of it. So there, I mean, it's like threefold, like the... Whenever you're talking about the, the presidential election, the politicians, the, the people writing the stories, and the audience who's reading it, you know, everybody's coming with some sort of bias, and um, it's affecting the way they look at it. Obviously, there's always going to be bias. We approach news as like, I want a completely unbiased source, mm -hmm. but that would be like a vacuumed... You know, with someone who came from like a, a vacuum sealed room and, you know, like an action figure basically. Yeah. <laughs> came out of a cellar and they'd never seen anything in their life and they're totally unbiased. That just makes, that just makes me think of the Goonies. <laughs> what was the Baby Ruth monster? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever his name So, uh, and, and I agree, that's, that's how it should be seen, that's how it should be done. Just the reason I ask is because there's so many ways in which. When it comes to bias, how uh, CNN will like only display the negative things Trump does. Fox News only displays the positive, and we 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 need, in my opinion, we need a middle ground of explaining like here's the positives, what just happened. Here's the negatives. Here is the possibilities, but here is also the failures sure, of sure. what could be going on. And, and I, I think that one good thing to note is. Uh, is uh, that people need to embrace the idea of biases. So, like you, you know, transparency is, has got to be the biggest thing whenever it comes to journalism. Um, understanding that you do have a bias. This person who's writing the story has a past. They have, you know, all of these things that have happened to them. Everybody is just sort of an accumulation of what has happened to them and the way that they've processed everything that's been done in their life. So everybody's coming to the table with a predisposition mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's it's important for the audience to view the material as such that okay this guy has a bias he's not some perfect thing whenever we idolize those people we do nothing but set them up for a, you know the, the ability to fall down mm -hmm. I mean they're just gonna they're just gonna fall on their um, backs because they don't you know nobody can live up to that kind of standard mm -hmm. it's it's way too difficult um, and we've seen that a lot with, with journalists now. We've seen these journalists that we held in such high regards as whether they're TV talk show type of personalities or whatever, like O'Reilly, we've seen them just fall because, you know, whatever kind of idea that their audience that favors them has about them, it, it's, it's just way too high in comparison to what they can actually be. Exactly. And so my question is with this because we have this gigantic attack on media and so many people are just saying that oh we should have just like what trump would said oh we should have a true news network and all that stuff which is reminiscent of the things that are going on in north korea where they censor everything to a point where it's just positive stuff about the country just positive stuff about the politics everything like that sure. which has led all those people to be brainwashed into believing that their leader is a god now i'm not saying that's what's happening here what i'm saying is just the fact that one man's opinion of who he thinks is the best at news just because they don't say a negative thing about them doesn't mean that should be the overtaking of everything. So my question for you is, what what is the importance of having all these different kinds of news styles, of all these different kinds of companies that they attack things from different angles and they go about displaying things to you from different options? Because when I think it comes to politics and things that are happening in this country, this is this is 100% necessary. You can't just give us one channel 
that shows us the news that's just bright and happy all the time. You have to show us everything that's going on for the people to be aware. So that's basically my question. What, what is the biggest importance of journalism, television journalism, and reporting? Sure. So, um, I mean, all of those fields are really, really different. It's really important, no matter which genre you're going into, it's important to look at the different sides, you know, whether even the fringes, it's important to look at all this stuff just to get an idea at, at the least. I mean, even if you're not going to budge on your opinions of whatever is going on, mm -hmm. it's important to see that there is another opinion, you know, what, um, no matter what it may be. But even if you, so politics, for instance, even if you're the type of person you just watch CNN or whatever, you know, obviously it's important to, to check out Fox, but it's difficult to say how that would differ from, you know, writing or, or documentarian style or whatever. Because um, those things are just very different. They're completely different things. I mean, whenever you're looking at Vice News or something and you're watching a documentary that's going in on, on, on some type of person, you're watching something totally different yeah, I mean, even as far back as like the business model that was created for it is entirely different than what, you know, CNN may be doing or, or um, Fox or whatever. It's just a completely different thing. And you have to realize that, that it's a completely different thing. So sure, watch, you know, all of these different sort of sides of the political spectrum and understand all of it, but also understand whenever you're watching something that isn't, you know, uh, your, your prime time television journalism or whatever, because it's, Vice is, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're every single thing I, I would say is, is generally different. Sure, they might lean in some certain direction because of how they hire and, you know, their, um, uh, the sort of motto of their organization, they might lean in a certain direction, but every single piece that they're doing is so different than the one before. See, and, and that's another thing I want to talk to you about, because you've been talking about, to me at least, about getting into document, uh, documentaries, and we're not going to reveal the one that you've talked about working on, because I want that to be a surprise, and want that whenever that comes to fruition to actually happen, sure. and then we'll talk about it then if you want to. But the way I see it is that when it comes to journalism, like everything, it's a business. So it's it's a huge thing of turning out a profit, but it's also huge in that what people don't realize is that companies that own CNN, that own MSNBC, that own Fox News, they're also they have parent companies. And what those parent companies will, uh, whatever else they own, they're going to tell those people, hey, if this company that we do that has that's been messing with Flint's water supply, you don't need to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So I. Sure. Why I think it's good about documentarian uh, is that, or documentaries, my apologies, is that you don't have the red tape, which we've talked about before, the red tape that you have in journalism where you can say this, you can say that, you can't talk about this, you can't talk about that, you can't report about this, you can't report about that, but in documentaries it's like, nobody owns you. Mm -hmm. Nobody owns you. You can get out there and like, uh, my best example is Blackfish. So these people came out there and they just absolutely tanked. SeaWorld stock. They accidentally tanked their ticket prices by showing, here's all the mess of stuff that happens to these animals. Here's how they should be living. Here's all the lies this company tells you. Now, not saying that all documentaries have to be going after people, but it allows you to remove the red tape that traditional journalism has. Like, let's say we're reporting, let's say, take me for example, let's say uh, there's a CNN wants to come after me, like, hey, we'd like to do a small piece on you about you trying to become a professional bodybuilder. Uh, Let's talk about this. And they're going to show you little snippets and maybe like seven to eight minutes long. It's all going to be about the positive stuff like that versus advice is going to come up to me and be like, hey, uh, we want to do a documentary about you You're a, a, and you transitioning, trying to become a professional bodybuilder. Ooh, I said transitioning. It's like I'm, just, I'm, a, I'm a woman now. Uh, but we wanted to show this and it's like they'll – delve in a little bit deeper, they'll start talking about the drug game that's in bodybuilding, they'll start talking about the politics, they'll start talking about the companies that own it, why people with bigger celebrities on Instagram and stuff like that start winning, versus all the stuff that a real news organization would leave out. Mm -hmm. So I guess my biggest thing is what's making you want to go into documentaries and what do you see yourself doing? Do you see yourself doing more just stories about people? Do you see yourself doing like investigative documentaries where it could be like Blackfish or yeah. something like that? Or do you see yourself really just doing a broad spectrum of everything? So uh, yeah, it's 
First, it's really important to note that there are gatekeepers in every, we talk about this a lot in, in journalism school. Um, anytime you're dealing with journalism, you, you have to talk about gatekeepers, even if it's documentary stuff or, or whatever. Um, you have to talk about gatekeepers. It's very important. And there's gatekeepers no matter what you're doing. Even if you're funding all of your own stuff, then you become the gatekeeper mm -hmm. or whatever. Right? So, like, even if I went into that, and we're not plugging uh, Vice, by the way. No, we're not, not plugging Vice. Vice is really good. Vice is a lot. I <laughs> like, it should be like six times. Bro. I like Vice a lot. But <laughs> I, I just want to so. say that they, they <laughs> certainly have gatekeepers, too. And they come to the table with all their own biases. And, I mean, a, a lot of their stuff is just purely entertaining. I mean, oh, yeah. that, I mean to say the least. But, and it's very informative. Um, the reason why I wanted to get into... Uh, documentary type of stuff and I'm transitioning in that direction um, is is because in fields uh, whenever you work for organizations whether it's a local newspaper or, or whatever um, sometimes you see departments that uh, one for instance that everyone I think is, is somewhat aware of would be like Spotlight mm -hmm. so Spotlight is a story about an actual like uh, group inside of a uh, newspaper. So mm -hmm. like you have that newspaper but the group inside would be like an investigation mm -hmm. type of group and they would go through and look. For those who don't know what Spotlight is, Spotlight is a movie about the story of the people who exposed uh, the Catholic priests that were molesting young children. And so that, that's what we're talking about. That That was such a small section, one of the few times you've seen actual journalism where they've allowed people to completely investigate a story and really like kind of like we're saying this is so huge, let's take that red tape and move it aside. So these, um, these groups, they usually, they're able, they're given a lot more liberty, they're able to write a lot more uh, long form, which is what I got into journalism for, mm -hmm. was long form, long content, they're like expositions that really explain whatever story you're kind of trying to tell. And, um, but if you try to go into that direction through, uh, you know, any kind of mainstream media organization, you're gonna have a really difficult time and you're gonna be put on a time frame that's probably, you know, you're not gonna be able to get into that field unless you reach the pinnacle, you know, the, the very end point of your career and then you finally become that whenever you're way, way down the road. Um, I have a passion for those kind of stories, you know, and I, I, I want to tell those kind of stories. I don't want to go through breaking news and all that stuff because mm -hmm. those departments are really, they're, they're really cutthroat and I, I, I don't uh, feel like they align with my moral values, mm -hmm. you know, getting news out as soon as possible, getting things that'll get clicks, getting things that'll do this and that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really align with what I, I believe in. Uh, my journalistic integrity. See, and I like that because you show the respect of that, of your, not only your morality, but of your actual, the freedom you want to be able to convey the story as best as possible, which is absolutely amazing. So we're going to take a brief pause right here. We'll be back in just one second. So, a little, another little fact about the Champ Cast and what we're doing here. We're drinking a little bit of wine, so in each one we're going to do this, it's going to be a little bit different. So it's like, I'm trying to break the regular format, just sitting down and just talking to someone and it being like awkward, which it was. It came to me because of him, actually. Uh, Jacob inspired me to do this podcast, and uh, the reason why, which perfectly rolls into my next question, is you've worked with the Dallas Cowboys, so you've had it, and you've played for me some of your interviews you've had with them, and how these guys talk, where they know they're not being talked, they know they have so much restrictions, and they know they can't be themselves, so they go into like this weird character of like extra studious, extra yada yada, and, uh, and and you see that it's it's almost like they feel like they're not being talked to like a person, which is why I, you and I discussed this format for doing my show like this, and why we're doing this like we are, because that we're at the end of the day we can talk intellectually about the questions that I'm having to ask, but at the same time I'm not treating you like, you're, I'm gonna, you're gonna say shit, I'm gonna say fifty thousand dollars fine, uh, or just, just treat you like Marshawn Lynch was treated, but my, my question for you is when it comes to censorship and how guys like that are being treated and why, once again, 
you're talking about switching over to the documentarian side of things, is that do you think the way journalism approaches interviewing people and all the red tape and all the things they are and are not allowed to say because of censorship, do you think that is a harbor on them and they really need to start being more free with their words? Because one of the main reasons I ask is I, I kind of saw it whenever Donald Trump made the shithole comments and that some of these news organizations were saying, uh, if you don't want to hear these words, mute them in the next five seconds, but Donald Trump referred to these countries as a shithole and they said it live on TV. I was extremely surprised. And it was quite a few different companies. Some of them bleeped about. Some of them, when it was writing, they put the uh, asterisks or whatever they are in there, and some wrote out the entire word. So I guess my main question for you is, do, do you think they need to let go of all these restrictions on censorship they have so they can get more of the appeal that the documentarians are having? Or do you think it's necessary to just keep this, like, all these people that are watching this in this safe little bubble where we can't say certain words? Hmm. Um. Well, I think that um, any decision that, uh, you know, it goes back to like what we were talking about before with uh, a journalistic organization being a business first and foremost, mm -hmm. you know, no matter what, especially now, I mean, whenever journalism is, is really uh, fighting off of, you know, I, I, I say it's fighting off its back leg, it's really trying to um, <clears throat> recover because, like we talked about, the attack on the media, we talked about, um, you know, newspapers dying, all of these things are leading to journalism to try to recover and find new ways to distribute content. You know, that's why we, they're having such trouble with uh, online sales and everything. Um, you'll see that a lot of journalistic organizations now have the firewalls that come up if you, mm -hmm. you know, view more than five articles, you got a firewall. Um, so they're really, really trying to figure out a model to to profit off of their journalism, um, but the censorship and and all of that it, it's not going to be left up to. I mean, it is in the sense that the, the organization is going to decide, but whatever they decide is just going to be a, a decision of how well that their business does. Um, the bigger decision is going to be that of the person who's viewing the content. Their decision is going to be made off of the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, everything that they do is off of demographics and understanding if people are going to tune into this or not. So, whatever the social climate is, if people are ready to hear Donald Trump say that, you know, whatever he says, Hades a shithole, then. <laughs> Then you know what the you know they're gonna make an executive decision and say okay we need to release this this is gonna get clicks or whatever this is gonna drive our audience or they're going to say no this is this is what you know the audience would deem inappropriate and it would look poorly on our organization. See, and one of the main reasons I ask this and why I bring up Donald Trump and this is going to be like one of the only champ casts that we get somewhat political in uh, just because I know that pisses too many people off is that. Uh, in that he is attacking the media at the same time and people talk about oh he needs to be more studious president yada yada he's also saying things that normal people would have to censor and let out and a lot of people are accepting it a lot of people are accepting it so it, the reason i've been asking about the censorship is because when you take what he's been doing and that realizing like well i said that all these different news sites are actually saying the word shithole on tv do you think like, with a butterfly effect, Donald Trump is slowly allowing censorship to kind of fade away and also realizing why were we so sensitive to these words, why were we so sensitive to these topics, because it seems like they're becoming more okay in the general populace, while if if Brad Pitt got up there and was saying, oh, well, hate is a shithole, people would probably freak out a little bit more, but the, the, the leader of the free world is saying this. It seems that more people are okay with it, while some a lot of people are not okay with it. Sure. But really saying not okay with it in the context of what he said, but with actual words that he's using with how he speaks on Twitter and things like <clears> that, <throat> how he refers to certain people, it seems like there's not such a harbor on censorship in that aspect when it comes to things that he says. Sure. And I'm wondering if inversely that will affect how it's seen throughout entertainment, throughout news and things like that. A few things. Um, first, I don't think that he's uh, ahead of the curve. 
to the <laughs> point to where he's he's like he's leading this trend in this direction. I don't think he is. I either. think that he's capitalizing. This, my, my personal opinion is that he's capitalizing on a social climate, mm -hmm. and he realizes, you know, um, and take for instance him saying that thing. Whether you're on the side where you uh, are, you know, you agree with what he said, or you completely disagree with what he said, um, I think both of those sides kind of wanted him to say it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Both of those sides uh, gain off of him saying that. The side that doesn't want him, that doesn't agree with what he's saying, uh, that side uses it as a tool to say. Donald Trump is a bad person. Exactly. And then the other side is saying, like, like Donald Trump thinks everyone wants to he's say. He's telling it like it is, yeah. you know? And uh, so both sides are sort of profiting off of this thing, and, and everybody's saying, well, you know, like, oh, a huge percentage of Americans don't agree with what he's saying, but they still want him to say it, kind mm -hmm. of. Like, See, and that's the thing is, I'm not saying he's leading a charge on attack on censorship or anything sure. like that. I just mean that he's capitalizing on the fact that the oversensitivity that's been happening in this country, whether it comes to uh, when it, how it started out with people uh, with racial issues shutting things down, then it transitioned into homosexuality, people's like censoring people and stuff like that, and now we're into the transgenderism where people are saying you can't even say him and her anymore and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think he just is capitalizing on the point that all these people who are old school are just like, oh, this is ridiculous, I can't say anything anymore. And he's saying things that even those people may not agree with what he's saying, they're just glad someone is breaking the mold. Uh -huh. And why I think that, uh, no way, shape, or form is he leading a charge. I don't think in any way he's like, oh, I want to take down censorship. I think he's just like, yeah. it's just his honest thoughts and his honest opinions. Yeah. And so I just think that somehow he is affecting the culture of censorship in this. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I, I think he's definitely affecting it. Um, I think it's, you know, it's just pulling the rubber band a little bit further and a little mm -hmm. bit further apart. And, uh, you know, it's testing our limits of, of free speech or whatever. I mean, that's, that's a big deal, too, to see how far we can get with free speech. And I think a lot of people are really working to test that on, you know, platforms like YouTube and mm -hmm. all of these things. They're really pushing it to the limits to see, I mean, some of them just for the sake of, you know, for the and hell I'm, of it. And I'm glad we transitioned we into that. Get. I'm glad we transitioned into that. So, I talked to you a little about this earlier. Uh, YouTube has now made it to where it's more difficult for, they, you have to, if you, they can select when you're cursing in a video and they can like say you're not gonna get monetized until either it's manually reviewed or until you censor it. And so, it's it's gotten to one of these weird things that let's take for example everything that's everyone knows I'm probably gonna mention this uh, a lot of this has come from the fact that Logan Paul showed a dead body in the suicide force in Japan what the actual Japanese force name is I do not know I mispronounce it horribly and then people come at me so I'm just gonna call it suicide force because that's what it is it's notorious for it and he kind of made a mockery of it and so this is where I like talking to you about documentaries and documentarianism because I think there should be a direct because at the end of the day, I'm contradicting myself when I say there shouldn't be any censorship. But at the same time, I feel like mocking something like this versus making it an education factor is a huge disadvantage and should not be done in our current culture. And it's a respect factor as well. And so, really my question to you is, where, where should that lie on censorship in the fact of entertainment versus actually education? Mm. Um. So, yeah, I th well, it, it, it's difficult organization by organization. It's going to be way, way different. I mean, you watch something on, I don't know, any, any, any organization, it, they're, they're going to be really, really different, and that has to do with the core values of the organization. Um, I think that when it comes to censorship, it's always going to be more a result of the market demand, which is a result of the social climate, which, mm -hmm. you know, it just kind of goes back and back and back. Um, but yeah, whatever, whatever the market, it, you know, is asking for, that, that's, mm -hmm. what, that's typically what they're going to get. I mean, I think that's what we're seeing with Donald Trump, he, you know, um, whatever... Whatever people are really asking for, whether it's on one side or the other, we want Donald Trump to be, you know, whether one side 
um, wants him to be a ridiculous idiot, they're going to get it. And whether they want him to be the noble leader that the says... The noble, outspoken leader. Yeah, yeah, that says things like Ronald Reagan, totally frank, totally on the table, like mm -hmm. transparent, mm -hmm. they're going to get that too. So everybody's getting what they want as far as, you know... It just all um, comes down to how they demeanor. interpret yeah, it. Yeah, it just comes down to how they interpret it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, organizations like... but. Purely entertainment organizations like YouTube or, or things like that, they're, it's just going to be off of the market. It's just going to be whatever um, the audience will watch and whatever they won't watch. I mean, we talk about Logan Paul, but, you know, let's, let's not be, you know, completely naive to the fact that that video got a ridiculous, ridiculous amount, amount of views. Of views. And, I'm, and I'm sure that that guy... Oh, yeah. Has got more publicity. I learned what his name was during yeah. the course, of and I had no idea. <laughs> and that was the thing is that we we did see that at least at this point it had consequences because there's certain things with YouTube that there's been issues like this in the past. They've done nothing, and they've done consequences by they're saying they're no longer promoting him. That they're no longer going to be uh, pushing him more and more in like their ads on like Google and stuff like that. So they're pretty much going to like disassociate with him completely. Still allow him to have his channel even after what he did. But at the end of the day, I think he's just, he's, he's coked up and he's stupid. And so he was like, oh, this can give me a ton of views, awesome. And it, do I think he was like maliciously showing a dead body? No, did he laugh at it? Yes. Did he make a mockery of himself and a suicide? Yeah, 100%. And so that's just where it's, it's, it's a curiosity to me that we can show something like that and there were people defending him and I know it's his low gang which fucking retarded title for if you call yourself a member of the low gang we don't have issues a little bit but uh it's 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 crazy that people would defend something like this and it really shows like you were saying there's such a split in the culture mm -hmm. of people defend something that's completely ridiculous or they would completely annihilate something they see as completely ridiculous. If people stop looking at the fact that um, if you cater to one audience, you lose the other. And Donald Trump caters to both. Yeah. He, he, he does the ridiculous stuff that the audience that hates him wants mm -hmm. him to do. And he does the, the um, brutally honest stuff that the people who love him want him to do. So exactly. he picks up both. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take one last break, and then we're going to come back with the finale. Cheers. So last things last. Uh, something that I find hilarious and that I think is a completely different form of, of if you want to even call it news, is tabloids and stuff like TMZ. First off, would love to know your answer. Why the fuck does it exist, first off? And secondly, why, why do you think it has such a value? Why so many people appeal into it? Why do you think people care so much? What is Kim and Kanye naming their next baby? Like, do you think it's just a dis they, they get a, a disassociation from the reality of all the fucked up stuff that's going on in the world? Mm -hmm. Or do you think it's honestly just... I don't even know. Like, I don't even know what the appeal of it is. Like, this is what has made the Kardashians famous, yeah. and I don't understand the appeal of it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think it has a lot to, like, uh, it, it, if, I mean, it's it, the easy example is to talk about readers. I mean, people who read a lot, if, if you ask them, they like to read different things. You have some people who just read Harry Potter fiction or whatever. <laughs> down to, I mean, they just go all in, and that's awesome, that's awesome. Some people read a little bit of everything, some people read only um, autobiographical type of stuff or whatever. It's the same instance whenever you're looking at news. People do the same thing with news, whether they're looking for something that validates their political opinion, whether they're looking for something that expands their political opinion, whether they're looking for something that just <laughs> is off the wall, doesn't make any sense, you know, uh, I don't know, Donald Trump is part of the Illuminati or something, <laughs> you know, which, I mean, doesn't seem that far-fetched, I mean, as I just far imagine as, them in their hooded cloaks going, as far as like a headline, <laughs> you know? I just imagine a bunch of people in school and cross ones hooded cloaks going, should we let Donald Trump in, it's just like, no, no, <laughs> he will give us a bad name, uh, so, uh, last few questions. First one, the main one, the reason why I made this podcast is for anyone who's looking to be a journalist, mm -hmm. looking to get into documentary filmmaking, anything like that, what is the best piece of advice you can give them to do it? 
Hmm. Uh, the best piece of advice. Um, well, I mean, there there probably be a few. First, you want to know that you want to do it because it's one of those fields that are really iffy. You know, it can be the, really appealing, but you may yeah, not. it's one of those things. Which I, I mean, there's a lot of areas that are like this. Like everyone says, you're not going to make any money. You're not going to make any money if you go in journalism. You're not going to make any money. Well, that's not really true. If you go to school and you get a degree in journalism, you can always work in public relations. You can always. Like, uh, even if you don't continue a career in journalism, which is typically lower paying, um, if you look at the majority scale of journalists, mm -hmm. it is typically lower paying, even whenever I was doing internships at various organizations, guys who had been there for 20 plus years would just look at me and be like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> you don't want to be here. And I'd be like, ah, oh, come on, man. Don't kill my dreams. Um, that happened a lot. It happened a lot. And it was it was painful. Like, every time. And every time I would tell myself, I'm like, no, it's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen to me. Um, but the challenges are still there. And sure, there are, there are anomalies. There are people who, you know, really just shoot up to the top. There's people who, I mean, there was a... Um, a girl at TCU with me who, I, I, she's still there I believe, but she, she has a job lined up for her at CBS. She became like, you know, just like beeline mm -hmm. to the big organization, beeline to that really successful path of journalism. But very few people get into that, that, that stream of, of, mm -hmm. of success. And um, it's really tough to get into it. I mean, to be just totally frank and honest, it's really tough to get into. But the good news for people who do want to be journalists is that the field is changing. It's like everyone who's a journalist now, it's like mm. there's an earthquake underneath their feet. I mean, they're freaking out. They're like, we're losing newspapers, mm. paid views are going down online because you can get the same news from Facebook, like from my friend who, you know, like say something happens uh, in D.C. or something like that. You can, well, my friend knows a guy who lives in D.C. He posted a video that he took himself and then all of a sudden I know everything that happened, you know. So those organizations uh, in, in some instances are becoming less and less, uh, you know, useful to the general audience. Especially it's when like, you see stuff like when people going off and doing yeah. their own things, such as even with the interview format, you see, I mean, the show Hot Ones and people like Joe Rogan are putting up the same numbers that Stephen Colbert is. Sure, sure. And it's just, it's, it's a certain point that people are breaking the mold, doing their own thing, and you see them being competitive with the big name companies. Sure, and this idea of uh, citizen journalism is revolutionizing everything. I mean. Yeah, even the journalistic organizations can't deny it. They're calling on these people and they're saying, can I please use the video that you posted on Facebook? And, mm -hmm. and the people who posted the video are like, seriously? You like, pay I, me, but yes. They're like, seriously? I, I, I just took this while I was in school. Like my teacher started throwing a fit, so I took a video of her. And, <laughs> and the, all of a sudden this new news organization is telling them they'll pay them however much money to get this video mm -hmm. so that they can, you know, get rid of it so it's really opening up I think the opportunities for freelance are opening up like crazy um, but if you want to if you want to jump into the field of journalism I think one of the biggest assets you would have whether you go to school or whatever and I think school is very important but whether you go to school or not is to learn a way to tell that story because that is the biggest driver in journalism knowing the, the form in which you're telling that story. Not so much in telling the story. I could sit here and tell you a great, amazing story. I could even write it down or whatever. Maybe you'd read it. But knowing that form, whether I'm a videographer or I'm a documentarian who's shooting video for Vice or whatever, they know how to tell that story, how an audience is going to come to that story. Um, so they shoot their documentaries really well. And people who are writers, they write their, you know, whatever long form journalism really, really well. I mean, just becoming uh, a, an aficionado at like that, at that one craft. And people, mm -hmm. people lose sight of that because they think, well, I'm a storyteller. And I know, you know, and I and I, and I want to tell people a story, and they get lost in, in just that. And then you go to journalism school, and you learn the, the 
basically all the boundaries that you're stuck in, the legal boundaries, whatever, and then you end up at you know, a local newspaper, you go to a local TV station and sort of move your way up slowly, slowly, slowly. Let me ask you, how important do you think internships are? Because I know in the college, a bunch of people will sit there and they say, oh, I want my summer's off, I want my winter's off. How, how beneficial do you think it was to you? Sure. Um, well, I think that I'm a little bit of a special case. I went to the military prior to doing any schooling, prior to doing anything. I, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do, to be honest. I found out that I wanted to be a journalist while I was in the military. Just I just became obsessed with reading mm -hmm. all of these, these, these famous journalists, uh, and I, I, was, I was just obsessed with it. Um, but do I think that internships are important? Oh my God, yes. Like I, whenever I was contributing for the Huffington Post, I was out in DC and we were, we were covering the 2016 elections and we were, you know, shooting content that had to be up that night. And I mean, it's just such mm -hmm. a, um, you, you, you really learn how journalism is work. I mean, you start to look at journalism as this thing is like, I'm telling one story, but that's not the case at all. Whenever you're in journalism, if you want to make money, then you're telling like 10 different stories at once. You're, you're telling, you know, you're doing something for them, something for them, something for them, and you're working on it a little bit at the time to build this up. Or, you know, you're, you're working for an organization that's like, look, I need something turned over in the next three hours. Like, hey, this person posted a tweet before they got on an airplane that was completely idiotic or whatever. And we need you to write up a story on it or get some kind of video content before that plane lands or mm -hmm. whatever. I mean, that's how cutthroat and quick it can be. And so, yeah, those, I mean, journalism, or internships, that's what it, it opened my eyes to the most was mm -hmm. what the industry actually looks like. And God, it's so important to, to, to do those internships. And I mean, if you're going into journalism, there's no other way that you're gonna learn how to navigate that field unless you do internships. I mean, it's really that cutthroat and it's really, uh, it's an intense field. Perfect. So, uh, last final few questions, just be quick answer. Sure. Uh, people saying I'm trying to be like James Lipton. James Lipton ripped off his format from a French guy. So, I'm kind of close, but it's James not exactly Lipton. the same thing. So, first things first, favorite swear word. Favorite swear word? Yeah. And it can be a conglomerate too. It can be like donkey dick or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I always uh, say, uh, yeah, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> like the mumble rappers, yeah, yeah. bitch. Yeah, bitch. Okay. Uh, that's, a, that's a Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> uh, favorite journalist. Oh, favorite journalist. Uh, this will, if it, any journalists are watching this, they'll get all upset. But this is a journalist. All right, Hunter S. Thompson. Okay. Perfect. Uh, don't Easy. know who he is. I'll have to look. Uh, favorite clothing and monsters. So uh, this is kind of a tough one because usually these guys are more obscure. So I gave a second option for this. Uh, favorite documentarian or documentary? Ooh, um, favorite documentary. Documentary. Um, probably. Oh, it's tough. I don't know. Um, man, there was one about. Uh, Fighting that came out. What was that? What was the one? Uh, Her business. Oh, oh no no no. Um, Tyson. What was the last Tyson one that came out against him and Evander Holyfield? I know which one you're talking that about. My, that was my favorite. Okay. What was the name of that? I don't remember. I oh, Chasing look. Holyfield. Chasing Holyfield. Yes, 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 yes. Chasing that one's fantastic. Holyfield. Oh, so good. <laughs> okay. Uh, so your profession in five words. My profession. In <laughs> I know that's a tough one. I like that question. And I came um, up with that. <laughs> uh, or five words or less. <laughs> Just count on your fingers. <laughs> Let's change it up a little bit. Just there it is. There, I got okay. it. I okay. got it. I got it. All right. Uh, <clears throat> my profession in five words. Um, my profession, my passion here. Mm -hmm. uh, just tell the damn truth. That's good. Might have been six, but that's all right. That works for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so last bit before we close out, do you have anything to plug or promote? Um, that can be your social media. It can be your 
information for anyone trying to get you for freelance or anything like that? Sure, sure. I, I'm, I'm working a lot of freelance lately. Um, I've been I've been doing a lot of things. So if anybody wants to email me, um, you can look me up on my my Facebook, Jacob Smith. I'm here in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and those will all be below. And if you're watching on YouTube, those will all be below in the uh, description. By the way. Yeah, and I'll be working on a. Uh, New documentary project uh, with Beast Mode Productions, um, who is also based in Fort Worth. So definitely check him out, Beast Mode. So perfect. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and like and comment on this. If you have anything you'd like to know from Jacob or anything like that, I'll make sure he gets back to you. Uh, probably not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> so, but if you have anything you disagree with, anything on the topics, let's try to keep the political bullshit out of there. We try to be as unbiased as possible on that. And last but not least, go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you're listening on iTunes or anything like that. Go Go ahead and subscribe to me and we'll be trying to post these out as much as possible. So other than that, we'll see you guys next time.